Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. We're going to start, even though I, uh, I imagine people will straggle in operating as they do on Indian stretchable time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Victor has very kindly agreed to join us, but has a very has a hard stop uh, in a, in, at about 12:30 when he has to get over back to downtown. And so, in the interest of making sure we have enough time to hear from him, we're going to get started. My name is Irfan Nuruddin. Uh, for those of you who uh, haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm a professor here in the School of Foreign Service and director of the Georgetown University India Initiative. And in collaboration with the Hancock University of uh, Foreign Service for the studies uh, and the Asian studies program here at Georgetown. We're very pleased to organize the event today. Uh, there's a couple of people I want to thank before I introduce our main panelists for this, off for this afternoon. This event would not have occurred without the collaboration of our colleagues at Hancock University. They have secured a major grant from the Korean Research Foundation to fund a multi year study on the question of middle powers and rising powers in the, in the 21st century world order. And the idea is that over the next few years to have a series of workshops here in Washington, D.C., in India, and in Seoul. And so today really is the kickoff of what will be a multi-year partnership uh, between Georgetown and Hancock in the very great. Uh, happy to have our colleagues from that university here. Welcome. I also want to thank Emily Paragamian, uh, the program coordinator for the India Initiative, who is responsible for getting you the lunch that you're enjoying right now and for making sure all the logistics run uh, as smoothly as they have. So thank you very much, Emily. It is a great honor to welcome two very distinguished uh, individuals over here who can speak about the issues of today's uh, topic uh, with sort of remarkable perspective as people who have served in government uh, for the United States, uh, the US government for different, uh, different periods over the last 15 years, and also uh, sort of top flight academics in their own right. Uh, Victor Cha is a professor here at uh, the School of Foreign Service and Director of the Asian Studies Program. Uh, I won't bother reading his formal bio, it would go on for way too long, uh, other than to suggest that you should take a look at the information sheet that has been provided to learn more about Victor. Uh, he is a foremost expert on, on Korea. He holds a career chair at the Center for Strategic International Studies here in Washington, D.C., as well as the position here at Georgetown. Ambassador Richard Barba has just finished a two-year stint as Ambassador of the United States to India. Uh, he returns to Washington, D.C. after a career both in government but also in the private sector working on issues of U.S.-India relations. And we're very excited also to announce that uh, just now with his signature, uh, Ambassador Barba is the newest uh, School of Foreign Service Centennial Fellow and will be serving in that capacity uh, at least for some. So welcome. So it's a really wonderful honor to have you formally affiliated once again with us. The, the plan of uh, operations is that Victor is going to sort of lead us off with some uh, prepared remarks, thinking about the question of rising powers in this 21st century, century world order, mainly from the perspective of Korea, after which Ambassador Varma will speak about the similar topic from the perspective of uh, India. And then we'll open up to Q&A. Since Victor, unfortunately, has to leave us a bit early, uh, Professor Kim has very generously agreed to step into his shoes, uh, very ably, I'm sure, uh, and will come up uh, to handle the Q&A portion uh, uh, in his own right uh, at that point. And at that point, you'll have a chance to meet him as well. So without further ado, and thinking of time, Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irfan, for that kind introduction. Welcome, everybody, to um, this wonderful um, initiative by Irfan and the India Initiative. I'm I'm supposed to make comments, but I'm really just the uh, the intro act for Ambassador Verma. Um, who, um, he's just returned from two years of distinguished service at our embassy uh, in India. I was telling him as we were walking over here. I don't know if any of you have seen the YouTube or the Twitter video of the farewell that the staff at the embassy gave for him. Um, just incredible. It's just incredible. And it shows that not only did Rich do a great job in, in, uh, in India, but his staff actually liked him <laughs> a great deal. Because I don't think they've done that for any of the previous ambassadors. So it really speaks to um, um, this, not, not just what a distinguished public servant he was, but also uh, what a genuinely nice person he is. Uh, 
that his staff felt so strongly about doing that for him. Um, and Irfan, as you all know, for any of you who've been um, uh, doing South Asia here in Washington, D.C., Irfan has really transformed what uh, George South's footprint when it comes to India and South Asian studies. Uh, he and his team, including Emily, have just been about the best thing that could have happened for Georgetown in the past few years when it comes to um, uh, India. So we're very thankful, thankful for that. Um, let me start off with some general comments about uh, middle powers um, uh, looking at uh, countries like Korea and India. Uh, and as I said, uh, that's really the appetizer for Ambassador Irma's remarks. Um, let me start off talking a little bit about what I think are the qualities of uh, successful middle powers. Uh, what are the attributes of successful middle powers? And then what role middle powers will play today in this very uncertain, you know, frankly very uncertain foreign policy environment that we live in with a new administration uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, first, let me just uh, note sort of five I think conceptual attributes of uh, successful middle power engagement. <clears throat> uh, the first of these, I think, is that uh, middle powers, and this is really a prerequisite, middle powers have to have some interest in the desire to provide uh, public goods for the international system. Um, this is usually the areas in which middle powers can play a very, uh, have about have value added is in terms of the provision of public goods. Public goods, by definition, are things that are not well provided for. Uh, it requires initiative. It requires overcoming the free rider incentive to, bar, to provide. Um, and so I think a prerequisite for a successful middle power engagement is you have to be interested. You have to value the providing the public goods to the international system, whether that it has to do with freedom of navigation, um, uh, global health security, overseas development assistance, whatever it might be. So I think that's one important element. Um, the second, and this is really more from the recipient side, is that middle powers in their engagement have to be seen as non-threatening for them to be effective. Um, <clears throat> this is the advantage middle powers have over great powers. Great powers by nature are peer competitive. So anytime a great power puts forward some sort of initiative, the opposing side always thinks that initiative is loaded with something, that um, there are ulterior motives. Um, a, a middle power has a distinct advantage in seeking to engage in a particular issue precisely because they're not a great power, and they're not seen as threatening. So if the United States proposes something, the Chinese get suspicious. If the Chinese propose something, the Americans get suspicious. But if a middle power proposes it, the same thing, it carries less of the baggage. I think that's another important aspect. A third, and a third concept, and I think and it's tied to the second, uh, is that middle powers are very effective when they're bridge builders. Right? Um, you know, if, and this kind of top follows intuitively from the notion of being non-threatening. If you're a non-threatening actor, in a particular issue area, you have the potential to build bridges between the peer competitors. So Korea, for example, is always trying to play this role in the trade and development space, trying to act as the bridge between uh, the newly developing economies and the advanced industrial economies. So that bridge building role, I think, is, is very important. Uh, Fourth, and this is a, a requirement of effective middle power engagement, is you have to have the bureaucratic capacity. Right. <clears throat> um, uh, being a non-threatening bridge builder, trying to provide public goods is not costless. It requires bureaucratic resources. Uh, and you have to have both the organizational capacity as well as the actual resources, the funds, to, to play that sort of role. And so I think you can have all the good intentions, but if you don't have those capacities, you can't really play that role. And then fifth, finally, um, it, and, and this, I think, often, I think this is, this fifth quality is one that the, uh, I think the political leaders understand, but I'm not so much the, sure the academics understand it, and that is the so-called hosting function. Right? Um, middle powers can 
make a big imprint on a particular issue, a particular space, by playing the hosting function. So whether you are Korea, for example, um, um, being willing to host the, the, the G20 summit, or be willing to host President Obama's initiative for nuclear safety and security, like the Koreans played a very aggressive role. They, they fingered sort of three issues that they knew were important to the Obama administration, nuclear safety and security, the G20, and global health security. And very consciously went out there and said, we'd like to host the next meeting of this or that sort of thing. And that hosting function, I think, is also very important. It requires bureaucratic expertise that requires uh, money, of course. Uh, but that is somewhere also where middle powers can occupy a central node in the network and play an important role. So what does that all mean for um, today in the situation today? You know, I think because we are, in, we are in a state of flux with a new administration coming in in Washington uh, that has not really yet made clear what its uh, broader strategy is to Asia or, or the world, and I think that really creates opportunities um, for middle power. Because whenever you have the United States in this sort of transition process, it creates um, reactions, or counter-reactions, as countries try to adjust to uh, a changing environment and uncertainty about where the US is going. Um, I think one of the reactions that it creates among countries as an instinctive, to the extent that they value the partnership with the U.S., is an instinctive willingness to do more burden sharing. And I think we're already seeing this from like, Japan, Abe has already talked about this. Um, <coughs> um, that when you sense flux on, on the part of the United States, your immediate reaction is not to distance, but to be positioning yourself willing to do more burden sharing. And so, that is a space where middle powers, uh, as I said earlier, their willingness to provide more becomes a very important part of the equation. So, um, again, the reaction in terms of burden sharing, I think, positions the middle powers very well. I think the other um, response that countries have when they sense uncertainty on the part of the United States is much more of a willingness to network um, among other alliance partners. And so that means while countries seek to reinforce their bilateral ties with the United States, they also seek to reinforce their ties with other U.S. allies and partners, um, whether it's the Japanese and the Australians, uh, the Indians and the Japanese. I think we, see, we start to see more of this. Um, and again, that is some place, that is another place where middle powers uh, can work in this, in, in this networking dynamic to try to bring together coalitions that can play larger roles in pro providing public goods uh, for the international system. Um, and then finally linked to that, I think, is um, there is a natural tendency for countries, as they sense uncertainty on the part of the United States, to, to do hedging, right, to hedge your bets. <clears throat> um, and the hedging dynamic, again, I think is another place where middle powers can play, uh, can play a role uh, in terms of uh, enhancing their position uh, and uh, enhancing their policy value added on outstanding issues of the day. Um, so, um, so I think that while, I believe that while there are certain requirements that middle powers need to meet if they want to be effective, uh, there is also the broader strategic environment in which middle powers act. Uh, and that environment, when there's uncertainty, is actually an environment that's conducive uh, to middle powers playing a larger role. Middle powers like Korea and India playing a larger role, uh, both in terms of burden sharing in the alliance and a larger role in terms of public goods in the international system. Um, so uh, um, I look forward to the discussion. I'm, I'm sorry that I have to uh, leave early. Um, we have, I'm hosting, a, actually hosting a, a, a second lunch in a, in a different location that I have to go to. But um, I look forward to the discussion. I want to thank Yerfan again 
for all that he's done, and it's a particularly a, a very great pleasure to have Rich Berman here uh, back on campus and as a Centennial Fellow. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. I will say uh, a couple things. First, uh, this is the first actual speech I've given in about a month, so uh, a little, little rusty, I apologize, but um, as Raj, who's sitting in the front row, knows, and who was one of our senior political officers on our team in India, uh, we did a lot of speaking. We were out every day doing several, several speeches, so I've had the, the last month um, to regroup. I uh, haven't done this in a while, but thank you for welcoming me back here. And it's, I will say, it's unbelievably good to be back at, at Georgetown. I will let you in on one secret. Um, when I left the State Department in the summer of 2011, I was out of government for three years, and I had a full-time job practicing law. I, you know, things were quite fine. Everyone was happy. And then I had lunch one day with Tony Ahrens, and he said, you know, you should really come back to Georgetown. And I said, to teach? And he said, no, you should finish your PhD. <laughs> and I said, well, that's interesting. I probably need to start my PhD, um, <laughs> let alone finish it. But he, um, he was quite persuasive. And uh, for about three or four hours each week for three years, I would disappear from my private sector life. I would show up on campus, sometimes in this room right here. I would be the old guy in the back of the uh, classroom. Um, and I managed to finish my coursework, finish my comps. In fact, I was studying for my comps while I was studying for my Senate confirmation hearing at the same time. <laughs> Not something I would recommend uh, for all of you. Um, you're, you're looking at two of three members of my dissertation committee right here, so I was definitely on the hook to do this event. Um, but, it is, uh, but we are, uh, I do endeavor to finish. I love this institution. I got my LLM from the law school. I got my JD from American. I've been in Washington for a, for a while, so it's great to be back here. I, I'm a firm believer that you got to keep learning, whether you're in a formal program or not, especially with what's going on in, in Asia these days. And so this is a, a great way, and I'm delighted to be a Centennial Fellow. Thank you for, uh, for allowing me that, that honor. And let me just say a couple words about both Victor and, and Irfan, but there's no one who knows more about Asia or East Asia than, than Victor. He is the go-to guy, uh, nonpartisan, bipartisan, whatever word you'd like to use, which in Washington is rare these days, just someone you can turn to when you have a critically important question in a, in a really significant part of the world. And I, I'm grateful for everything that he's done in the public sector, in the, in the consulting, but also in just mentoring uh, people. And Irfan, uh, thank you for, for what you've done, not only in South Asia, but India in particular. You know, when I was growing up, um, we had plenty of scholars that knew the Soviet Union. You know, that was if you did Soviet studies, boy, you were relevant. And then as you got, you know, a little older into the, into the 90s, you know, we had plenty of China scholars, <laughs> East Asia scholars, and there were a lot of people that understood and understand China, what's happening in East Asia. But I will tell you, there weren't that many people that knew that much, at least at this level, about South Asia and particularly of an absence of India scholars, India-related scholars. And I would say that Georgetown has turned that around. Irfan is at the front end of that, and your scholarship is noticed. Um, you're going to be at the top of this field for, for quite a while, and uh, it's a big deal. So, so thank you for, for leading um, this initiative. I will um, say that so this is my first speech in a, in a month or so. People have been asking me kind of what I've been doing since January 20th. And it's been a, it's been a good last month. I, uh, I traveled to Nepal right after I left the embassy and I had to fill out the visa application and there's a block there for employment status. <laughs> and uh, for the first time in a while I could list unemployed. Um, 
and I've uh, I've gotten to learn some basic skills that have not left me completely. So dishwashing, dog walking, <laughs> uh, cooking, uh, making dinner for for the kids. You should know that. Um, all those skills come back to ambassadors very quickly. Um, so I, I haven't lost it. Let me let me get right to the to the subject because I'd rather uh, have a conversation with you than than drone on. I, I will say I'm not completely convinced the term middle powers middle powers is the best term to describe uh, India. And uh, I say that based on the factors that Victor just went through. I was thinking about um, whether India can really be seen as non-threatening uh, to some of its neighbors in particular uh, in this day and age, uh, whether um, they can do the hosting function and build bridges. I just I have some questions about that, but, but more directly, my experience in India over the last couple of years suggests that there is a certain velocity to the events and the developments there, and that what I saw was very much a rising <coughs> power, a power that is on the move. And whether a, a middle power can still be a rising power or not, I just, I just don't feel right calling India a middle power, given what I, what I saw firsthand. And you know, one of the great things about my experience was that I was able not just to spend time in Delhi with policymakers, but I traveled to every state in India, 29 states. In fact, we had a, a tweet hashtag that was 29 states in 26 months. Um, it was hard to do, but one of the amazing things that you see is just the rapidity, the kind of enthusiasm, the energy, and for a lot of the kind of dire stories that's painted about India, a place with a lot of um, uh, fissures and a place with a lot of instability, I just I didn't see it. I saw a country really uh, on the move and, and a country that was quite uh, exciting. So let me let me do three things. Let me let me talk to you about why first I think it's a country on the move and rising. And second, I'll just say a little bit about the kind of U.S.-India relationship and why I think that's an important part of the story. And third, I mean, I think we also have to be grounded in reality. Let's talk about some of the challenges that India is actually uh, facing. So um, let me just say, why, why is this a country on the move? Because I think you can say it, but, but what's the evidence that it's a country on the move? And I even go as so far as to say, well, Nate, when scholars talk about the 21st century as an Asian century, I actually think we could be more specific. I actually think this has the potential to be an Indian century, an Indian century, and I, and I really I believe that. And, and I just, that, that sense of incite, excitement and enthusiasm, I just contrast that with the experience my, um, my parents had growing up in India, in Punjab. My mother and grandmother were products of the partition, uh, arrived in Punjab in 1947. My, uh, my mother as a 12 or 13 year old at the time. Uh, my father uh, was a high schooler at the time. And my dad even tells me in 1947 he was supposed to graduate from high school and his whole school was closed for a year. He had to suspend his high school graduation for one full year so the country could basically get back to calming down. But it, it's not as if things just got better by 1948 or 1949. My brother used to tell me that even in the early 60s, he would remember the conflict against Pakistan. He would remember the air raid sirens that would go off. He would remember having to hide uh, in the neighborhood. My point is, this was a, a place for decades of great uncertainty, great instability. Didn't know if this democratic experiment was going to work. And there was incredible conflict, violence, uh, and just real risk to people. And so in a very short period of time, in a very short period of time, India has turned that corner. And so that, that's why I just that contrast between my parents' experience and what I saw over the last two years was really, was really quite striking. So what are, um, what are some of the numbers that you know, you guys are all in, in academics, you, 
taught me that data is important. I think it's important to talk about some of the data. Obviously, just on pure economic growth numbers, 7% uh, is a reasonable figure for Indian growth. Some people predict 8%, high 6%. But no reasonable um, person in the economics field is suggesting India is going to be much lower than uh, high sixes, low seven percent growth, and that's that is into the into the middle and and uh, near future, which is really uh, impressive. What's the impact that that's had um, since um, 1991, or actually in the last 40 years, the poverty rate has gone from the mid 40s to the low 20 percent. So about 22 percent of people in poverty now in India. That, that number used to be around 47 percent. So regardless of what party you might support in India, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, the fact is people are coming up out of poverty at pretty significant uh, levels. So there's the economic piece. And again, the specific numbers are 48 percent to 22 percent in the past four years. That's a, that's a big deal. Now, the demographics also give you reason to be hope. Now, the economists talk about a demographic dividend. If there was ever a demographic dividend, it exists in India. Two-thirds of the population under the age of 30. Two-thirds of the population under the age of 30. And if you just look out 13 years, 2030. 2030 used to seem like a long way away, and now uh, it doesn't seem that far away. Let's just talk about some of the categories that India is going to lead. It will obviously be the world's most populous country by 2030. It'll have, I think most importantly, the largest middle class in the world. The largest middle class in the world. It will have the most college graduates in the world. Think about that. So not only the most people, but you'll have the biggest middle class, and you'll have a very educated group of people, the most college graduates. You will have the most patent holders. So technology will continue to be a big part of, of India's future. India will produce more millionaires than any other country. It will have the third largest economy in the world. And if you do purchasing power parity, People will say it will have the world's largest economy, but it'll be up there, uh, right there with the United States and China. It will have the third largest military in the world. Now, two-thirds of the infrastructure that India needs in 2030 doesn't even exist. So over the next 13 years, think about the investments that India is going to be putting into roads and airports and ports and bridges and schools. It's going to be a massive investment in infrastructure. And again, by, by 2030, the OECD says that India will have one-fifth of the world's entire working age population. Think about that. And that it will be one of the slowest aging populations. So this dividend that we talk about, OECD predicts, will last for nearly 35 years. We're not just talking about 13 years. We're talking about having a very young population for about 35 years. So you get outside of the demographics, why else are we excited? Big, loud, constitutional democracy. That works at the end of the day. It's not pretty. Ours is not pretty. Uh, but it works. And if you look at the freedoms that are ingrained in the Indian Constitution, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, again, it is not perfect. There are plenty of growing pains that they are going through. And again, when people complain about, geez, look at the ex extremism or look at what this member of a particular party said, you know, I think this is one time where we can hold a mirror up to ourselves yep. and say, you know, 240, 250 years later, we're still working on it too. This is a fairly young democracy. But my point is, it is a democracy. It is a democracy with a huge demographic and economic set of factors that are working in an especially good direction. And so, 
when I when I say we're excited about India and that it's India on the move and India on the rise, these are why some of the numbers, some of the data backs up that conclusion. What's even more exciting is that India's rise is taking place amongst Asia that is rising. And when we look around the world and we see trouble spots, we see it in Europe, we see it in Russia, in Ukraine, in Crimea, we obviously see it uh, across the Middle East and Northern Africa. We see great risks, we see great kind of economic uncertainty and corruption in parts of Latin America. But Asia, despite its problems, and by this, by Asia, I mean the Asia Pacific, so that would be the, the subcontinent through uh, Southeast Asia into East Asia. The trend lines are all very good. 60% uh, of the world's population lives in the Asia Pacific. It is the leading destination for US exports. You have five economies in the Asia Pacific, over a trillion dollars, uh, which is really remarkable. Um, Again, absolute poverty across the Asia Pacific. 600 million people across the Asia Pacific have been lifted out of poverty. So you're taking India as one example, but across the region, there's been incredible uh, growth. And again, average age in Asia Pacific is quite low. Places like Malaysia, places like the Philippines, the average age is 25, 25 years old. Uh, think about that. And just from a self-interest perspective from the United States, we're relatively popular in, in parts of Asia. <laughs> you know, you don't often, um, especially in today's day and age, but you know, in India, the United States falls at 70%. Uh, again, in Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Korea, uh, Japan, Indonesia, uh, American polling and American, you know, the view of Americans actually quite, quite positive. So I am quite optimistic about India quite optimistic about its role, larger role in Asia, and the trend lines that we're seeing. The other thing about Asia, which I think is worth noting, um, Freedom House, if you look at some of their recent studies, they will tell you that the one region in the world that has actually had growth in democratic systems or, or more space being created in civil society is actually in Asia. Now, we don't often see that because we see the China case in front of us over and over and over again, and we think, how can it be possible? But if you look at what's happening in South Asia and Southeast Asia, there is this push for more democracy, more push for civil society, and that's a good sign. And the final thing I'd say, just from a strategic stability point of view, you know, you think about it, we've got five treaty alliances in Asia, uh, we've got 60% of our Navy there, we're gonna have 60% of our Air Force there, and, uh, you know, that's a big deal. So the economics, the demographics, the role that India is playing all line up in a way that make me pretty optimistic. Now, let me just turn quickly to what we were doing about it over the last two years from the U.S. perspective and uh, why I, again, uh, have reason to be optimistic. You know, for those of you who know anything about the U.S.-India relationship, you can go back to 47, or you can start at anywhere you'd like. When President Kennedy was there with Ambassador Galbraith, um, you know, we've had some we've had some peaks in the relationship, and then those would quickly be followed by some depths in the relationship. So we have had a roller coaster uh, for 70 years in the U.S. and India relationship. Cordial, friendly, most periods of time. Let's let's set aside the early 1970s when things didn't go so well. Um, but generally cordial, but we were not strategic partners. We were not the best of friends. We were not natural allies, as the President and Prime Minister talked about. But something very, very different occurred over the last two to three uh, years. I would say it started 20 years ago when President Clinton uh, visited India, spent a week traveling around the country, and literally millions of people came out to see him. It was this kind of break in a, in a long uh, thaw in our relationship. And that was quickly followed up by the Bush administration, which did really important things in civil nuclear cooperation and defense cooperation. And then President Obama in 2009 wanted to come out of the box strong on India. First state dinner was with the, with the Indian Prime Minister, and then it <coughs> fell off again. 
And then there was something about the last three years where things clicked, and I don't see it falling back down. Now, obviously, it's a different administration now in Washington, and they'll have to make their own judgments. But this relationship is now on an upward track that we've not seen uh, in a long time. Now, again, I'm a believer in data. It's easy for me to say that. Uh, but why should you believe it, I guess, is the question. And let me just give you a few numbers which I think are instructive. U.S. India uh, trade was the highest ever last year, highest than it's ever been. Uh, India's a uh, U.S. is India's largest trading partner in goods and services. India has a huge trade surplus with the United States, almost $30 uh, billion. Defense sales topped $15 billion for the first time ever. $15 billion in a time of shrinking defense budgets. This went off the charts. But more importantly, we are now talking about building things together, complicated things, significant things, frontline fighters, a new aircraft carrier for India. We did something we've not done with any other country. We designated India a major defense partner. That is a status and a term that doesn't exist for anyone. We made it up out of thin air, to, to be honest. But it's important because it basically treats India as one of our closest allies and partners. A lot of people already know this, but I'll say it again. India does now more military exercises with the United States of America than with any other country. I landed on four aircraft carriers in two years. Now, I never thought that would be part of the job description. But I mention that because that's where the action is. I went to Red Flag in Alaska with the ambassador and his wife. I went uh, to the Special Forces exercise. I went to the Army exercise. When you see our militaries cooperating together, it gives you great hope. These are militaries overseen by civilians, very professional uh, militaries. And their, their set of capabilities, we used to not be able to talk about how they're cooperating. We would never say the word interoperability. Now we talk and practice about protecting and saving people in dangerous situations. That's a very, very good development. We broke records in consular affairs. We issued more visas than ever before last year. We had more Indian students in the United States than ever before last year by a long shot, 20% higher than the previous year. Our president and prime minister met a record nine times in 30 months. We had three full-scale summits in just two plus years. We have 100 new initiatives, 40 government-to-government -government working groups. I could go on and on and on. I only bring all this up to say there is something now fundamentally different about the US-India relationship. And I felt very good about handing off the football to the new team, it is up to the new team whether they seize this moment or not. And I hope they do. Finally, let me talk about the challenges, because I don't want you to be too happy about what's happening. Uh, <laughs> there, I think, I think we should have a, a, dose of, uh, a dose of reality. That huge demographic dividend I talked about can also be a bit of a albatross as well. So think about it. India has one million new entrants into the job market every month. How does a country or a government or any society create 12 million new jobs every year just to keep pace? There is urbanization taking place in India, the move from the rural to the city on a pace that we've never seen in human history. The amount and the number and volume of people moving from the country to the city is unprecedented. India will have more mega cities in 20 years than any other country. This will create great strains on governance. This will create great strains on resources. And so we have to watch that very closely. And again, the scale of some of these numbers is staggering. So think about this. <coughs> Today, there are currently 300 million people without electricity. 300 million people that are not connected to the grid, that cannot turn on and off a light switch. 
you've got 700 million people that still live in villages, and you've got 500 million people that don't have indoor plumbing, no toilet in their house. So this great dividend I talked to you about also comes with incredible um, burdens, a burden on any government, both national and state. And if you weren't worried about the internal economic and demographic challenges, then you can face transnational threats that India faces and that the region faces. So climate change and severe weather events, we've seen it in space with incredible drought in northern India, water tables are at historic lows, monsoons are erratic, mm -hmm. could go on and on, but the, the, the reality is our militaries <coughs> are cooperating more to deal with extreme weather related events than almost any other situation, so the impact of climate change is quite real. Uh, criminal gangs and networks, drug trafficking, human trafficking, big problems now because of the porous borders around India. Uh, very diff difficult situation. Obviously, extremist groups, cross-border terrorism, a central concern, unfortunately a daily uh, concern, and unfortunately new groups like ISIS uh, would, would like to actually create more turmoil in a place like India because it's a democratic, pluralistic society that is working. So this, this comes with a big target. And so this notion of, of extremism and cross-border terrorism, of course, is a big concern. And then, of course, there are the countries of concern for India. And I always describe it to people that, you know, in the short term, it is, it is their neighbor to the west and Pakistan and the cross-border challenges that that presents. And then, obviously, uh, China and the elements of competition and, and cooperation that it faces from China over the long term. But these are these are very real issues. And then, if that wasn't enough, there is the uncertainty in Afghanistan and what happens with the Taliban. Will they uh, will they remain not only a threat to the Afghan people, but will they remain a threat to the Indian people? So there's. There is enough out there, but I do want to close and mention just two, I don't know if I'd call them threats or uncertainties that I think we should all think about. And uh, people at institutions like this should spend some more time thinking about it. And I think one of the real open questions for India, and it's something the Prime Minister said when he came to Washington last summer to address a joint session of Congress. He said, the reason why India is different now is because we have finally overcome the hesitations of history. We've overcome the hesitations of history. I just would maybe test that assumption with all of you. Have they really overcome the hesitations of history? Are they ready to go from middle power to rising power to global power? And if so, what's the evidence of that? Can a country be non-aligned for 70 years and then tomorrow be an active member of the UN Security Council, the G20, APEC, other international institutions? Can their navy play a role projecting power beyond the Indian Ocean region? Can they be a global actor? Have they overcome the hesitations of history? I don't know the answer to that, and I think we should ask ourselves that question. Finally, uh, Victor touched on this. I think one of the biggest, we call it X factors, not only for India, but across Asia, is what is the US role going to be? That was not a question for me six weeks ago. And I don't want to make that a partisan critique or a partisan shot, because I think for 100 years, since World War II uh, or, and before, the United States had been a Pacific power, preserving, upholding, guaranteeing the post-World War II order. Let's be real, there was no other country that came close <coughs> to doing what we did, what we do, and what we're capable of doing to protect basic norms and values. And it's not just through military means, it's through our power of 
in politics, it's through our role in institutions, it's through our diplomacy, it's through our trade, it's through the standards we set. I honestly don't know where we're headed now in Asia. Now, the visits by Secretary Mattis have been very helpful. The visit of Prime Minister Abe to uh, Washington and then the 36 holes of golf was very helpful. But I think we have to be honest that there has been a degree of uncertainty thrown in to the mix in Asia. And the one thing that Asia does not need is uncertainty about the U.S. role and about the U.S. position. Because let's be real, let's be honest, it is a battle for influence. Uh, countries that were looking to us, if they don't have us around, they will find other partners. And it, in a way, it creates an interesting opportunity for India. Because it will go out and forge new partnerships with Japan, with Australia, deepen commitments it's, it's started in recent times. But it would be an unfortunate, I think, development if the U.S. was not playing the role that it's played in the Pacific as it has since World War II. And so I think that's, that's I, I leave it out there as something we all have to watch. I don't know that we can um, know what the exact answer is because that seems like the, the policy is, is still being formulated as we go. So I'll just wrap up there and, and say, look, even without, with those uncertainties, I'm still very optimistic. Uh, grateful for having had the kind of front row seat for the past two plus years to actually see it up close. If we get things right, not only in our bilateral relationship, but if India continues to progress the way it does, it, it bodes well for peace and prosperity, not only in Asia, but globally. I look your questions. Thank you. So before we enter the q &A, and maybe at the risk of taking something of a partisan shot, let me just say that there's probably no testament uh, more uh, sort of present about America's benefits from immigration than an ambassador to India who's Indian American and a former expert on Asia who's Korean American. So <laughs> as we forge ahead in thinking about America's relationship to its borders, uh, I hope people pay attention to the remarkable talent that has come to this country because of a particular orientation to immigration. It is a real pleasure and I'm very grateful to Professor Kim Jong-ho uh, for joining this uh, panel at this stage. Uh, let me welcome him up, if you would, sir. Uh, professor Kim is um, a professor uh, in the Hankook University of Foreign uh, Studies. Uh, previously, as the bio indicates, he was Director of External Relations for the Korea Institute of National Unification and a research professor at Yonsei University. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll, uh, I'll use the privilege of uh, playing moderator to ask a couple of questions to start the conversation, and then we'll open it up. When we do, please uh, introduce yourselves to our panelists so they know who they're talking with, and then we look forward to your questions. I'll do this from here as well. And we do have a mic, uh, which I'll use, and I hope it's coming through clearly. Let me start by asking something uh, to get you into the conversation. but. Uh, somewhat rudely to ask a somewhat maybe awkward question, which is that when we think about Korea and India, in addition to all the promise, the word that neither Victor nor uh, Ambassador Varma used was the language was talking about corruption, right? And yet in Korea right now we have a corruption scandal that has brought down president, <laughs> and in India even though the current national leadership has kept its slate clean, corruption is a persistent part of how we think about Indian politics. And so I guess the question is, to what extent does governance, these fundamental governance challenges of getting the domestic politics in order, really become a major obstacle to the foreign policy ambitions? Uh, right? if, if countries are so unable to keep domestic politics clean, can they actually aspire to uh, be role models, to be agenda setters, to be rule makers for the global, uh, for a new world order? So, again, Baptism by fire, <laughs> but if uh, any of your thoughts on that would be welcome. Um, let me just uh, begin by um, introducing my research background a little bit uh, before um, tackling, well, trying to tackle uh, the question uh, by Professor Dudin. Um, 
Um, as, as introduced, I'm Tango Kim. Um, um, at this time, I'm the Dean of the Division of Language and Diplomacy at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, uh, which, like the uh, School of Foreign Service, uh, we aim to produce um, diplomats not only for Korea, uh, but also for the international community as well. My research interests uh, are on South Korea's foreign policy. Uh, of course, uh, I started out my PhD with that. Um, um, and of course, in order to do so, I need to analyze its environment. And then, of course, um, after the Cold War, the pillar of the structure of the environment has been, of course, the Sino-American relationship. Uh, as, as the ambassador mentioned, how uh, the United States influences the Asian Pacific region is very important. Um, as in trying to get closer to, to your question, um, a comment on uh, the middle powers. Um, I completely agree with um, Ambassador Burma on, on that um, India has, has never really been classified as a middle power. It's, it's always been a regional great power, a uh, potential great power on the global scene. Um, I've written a couple of papers on um, South Korea being a middle power, and that's also difficult to um, fit in theoretically as well, because uh, the theoretics of, of middle power has been based on uh, the developments with Canada in particular. Uh, one of its trademark cases is, of course, the Ottawa process. Um, and this is sort of the trademark case uh, for the theory of middle powers. And, and, and it's basically uh, trying to get rid of landmines, anti-personnel landmines, uh, the initiative Canada led. Uh, now, in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone in South Korea, between South Korea and North Korea, we have tens of thousands of these anti-personnel landmines deployed. And these are manufactured in the United States. So along with the United States, we stayed out of the Ottawa process as long as possible. So, um, and, th and this with a track record of trying to develop nuclear weapons in South Korea during the 70s. Um, I'm not so sure if we could classify ourselves even as, as, as a um, middle power. We are certainly an aspiring middle power um, in, in the both positional and behavioral sense. Um, now to, to the question at hand, um, you know, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer this, but um, because we are simply an aspiring power to, to, to be a middle power, um, yeah, certainly the degree of chaos, and I, I, I couldn't call it anything less, the degree of chaos, of course, does limit our foreign policy. Uh, particularly if you want to lead something, an initiative, uh, become a model of a middle power, or whatever that might be, yes, it is. It's, it's, uh, it, it's become a, somewhat of an insurmountable uh, obstacle to, to what we aspire to be. Um, as, as to what sort of degree of corruption um, and, and what I just call chaos is, is enough uh, to, to allow that to happen, I simply don't know. Um, first of all, I'm not an expert on uh, domestic politics. Uh, second, I've never seen such um, chaos in South Korea before. And certainly, uh, we are without a, a, a diplomatic leader at this point, which uh, in Korea, uh, the president has always been taking the leading role in, in, in initiating foreign policy. So um, uh, I, I think I can go as far as to say that we're sort of incapacitated at the moment because of the chaos, but I don't think I can define a, a certain degree of crisis or corruption which limits that theoretically. Yeah, look, anyone who's ever um, spent much time in India and has had to, you know, let's say, go to get a local permit or, you know, build an addition on your house or, you know, any interaction at the local and state level was always fraught with the um, real chance of a shakedown, let's be real. And it was part of the pattern and, and practice I will say, I think things are really changing. And at least at the national level, you know, and a lot of credit to the Prime Minister and, and his team, but frankly, a lot of credit to the electorate that I think part of the reason 
he was put into office was to clean up government. Think of the huge anti-corruption movements. This is a really interesting case where technology and social media kind of came together in a way to give this anti-corruption fight uh, real legs. And that's what it takes. It takes the people having the ability to kind of speak out against it. And they did it full-throated. And, and the Prime Minister, I think, heard that loud and clear. We, you know, we've gone two and a half years without a major scandal at the national level. Now, in India, that's a big deal. <laughs> then the question is, what's happening below that? What's happening at the state and local levels? The other good thing that's happening is that there's now a lot of transparency at the state level, especially as they're looking for more investment, more interaction with outside investors and businesses. Someone gets shaken down for a bribe, people now talk about it, they report it. There's now accountability, people get prosecuted for it. And so that's actually very encouraging. So this takes a mix of will, checks and balances, legal systems, a change in culture. Now I think where it is probably still happening a lot is if you go one layer down. If you're an individual having to engage with a, a, you know, some engine of, of local government, I think it's probably still a bit of a challenge. Part of the reason, if, you, if you've been following the news about the demonetization issue, kind of taking the kind of currency, the kind of black money out of the system, Part of the reason people were willing to stand in line for hours to get their own money out of the bank or to change their money or to go to six different banks before they could get money was because they thought it would put a dent in corruption. And so they were willing to endure some pain in order for the greater public good of, of cracking down on people that have been feeding off of vulnerable people for a long time. People are willing to, to sacrifice that. So I think things are, are trending, frankly, in a better direction. One of the comments you made in, in reflecting on the hesitations of history uh, remark that Prime Minister Modi is something I want to push you on. Because in your answer, you sort of framed non-alignment as the antithetical to being a rising power. So maybe if I may suggest that, in fact, if you think about non-alignment, at least as articulated in the 1950s, it was really to provide uh, another way to be a great power, one that did not necessarily involve aligning either with the Soviets or with the Americans, right? Is, that, is there such a role still uh, possible? Could you imagine India being a great power, but one that doesn't necessarily align with the United States as tightly, yeah. such that it provides an alternative to US power? I think that's a, that's a really good point, and maybe, um, <coughs> global power and non-alignment are not the right kind of juxtapositions because I think, I, I was not trying to argue that India has to choose between the West or the East or, or Russia. I am arguing that India has to choose what it believes and articulate that on a global basis, not just within the four corners of its country. So in other words, not having a view on what happens in the Human Rights Council, not a global power, right? Uh, not being able to condemn another country's invasion of another country, whether that's, let's be real, let's, whether that's the US going into Iraq or whether that's Russia going into Crimea, I'm willing to look at both examples. Um, but sitting it out and not having a view, I don't think I would characterize that as kind of you know, of being a global player. Mass human rights abuses in Sudan, mass uh, kind of human rights abuses in Myanmar. You know, take your pick. I think if India wants to be a global power and, and graduate into this different club, it will have to break out of those hesitations of history. So I, I think your point is well taken. Not that it has to be aligned necessarily with Western interests, but to, to play it straight down the middle without kind of putting its, its fingers on the scale is not what the international system needs. Now, that's my view. Other people, obviously, probably are much, you know, I think the Russians probably have a very different view. Um, and, but that's, that's how I would come at it. Thank you. So, a uh, question for you. In some sense, you refer to Korea's lack of a 
diplomatic leader without a president right now. The United States finds itself in an interesting situation where it has neither an ambassador uh, right now to Korea, I mean, they have acting ambassadors, but to Korea or to India because of the decision to uh, recall the political ambassador. So I'm not going to put Ambassador Varma on the spot to remark about that, but from your perspective, thinking about the very deep relationship of the United States and South Korea, mm -hmm. right? Uh, could you give us a sense of how uh, those of you who are paying attention to foreign policy are thinking about the Trump administration, what comes next? The Asia pivot was such a core part of the Obama administration's foreign policy agenda. By all accounts, TPP's dead, the Asia pivot, if it ever occurred, is not going to happen in all likelihood. So what, from where you sit, do you imagine the next two to three years looking like? What should we be paying attention to to see what's coming next? Um, <coughs> uh, thank you. Um, as the ambassador said once again, um, U.S. involvement in the Asia Pacific began a century ago. In fact, it starts with the acquisition of the Philippine Islands in the 19th century. Uh, and then, and then uh, prior to that with the uh, China Pai period and all that. Um, it's strategic interest of, of not or, or preventing a hegemon in East Asia, like the strategic interest of the United States of preventing a hegemon on the continent of Europe. This is, these are the reasons why they fought, uh, the United States fought the First World War, Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnamese War. That is to prevent the hegemon from appearing in these two regions. Um, so those strategic interests is not going to change simply because you have a very, well, uh, well different type of president than, than, uh, than ones we were used to in the United States. So I don't believe there will be drastic changes with the, even with the Trump administration. I think the core interests of the United States in Northeast Asia in particular remains the same. And that is to curtail Chinese influence, um, preserve its allies. Um, so um, I, unlike most people, uh, particularly in the media, I, I really don't see um, severe changes coming in our way with the uh, Trump administration. Uh, one thing I am concerned, um, and, and I think many of my colleagues share this concern with me, is, is the strengthening of Japan as, as the pillar of the U.S. Um, alliance system in, in East Asia, and, and what effect this may have on the reactions that China could bring. Um, this becomes a lot more complicated with, with North Korea in that equation. Okay? But simply put on, on the rivalry between the United States and China, and then the United States trying to uh, push Japan, or Abe pushing himself, uh, Japan that is, to become a, a greater military power. That is going to have huge consequences. Uh, reactions from China, I think you can imagine. But even reactions from South Korea, could become publicly severe. So um, I think um, that's a concern that our strategic analysts uh, share, uh, I think, throughout Northeast Asia. Um, that is something that I think uh, this administration, the Trump administration, can touch and, and, and make a difference. Uh, we hope it's not that way. Uh, we hope it doesn't go that way. Uh, but but initial signs are that the strengthening of, well, not, not they haven't really strengthened the, uh, the American alliance with Japan, you know. Uh, you know, uh, 36 holes of Gulf doesn't do that, okay. But if, if they are putting more strategic assets, military assets, that is, into Japan, that is going to tip the balance that, that China fears that it is always, is already losing. So, um, I hope he's a little bit careful with how he deals with Japan because that's, that could have quite a lot of implications for the uh, strategic scene um, for the next 20, 30 years. Let me, let me ask you one last question, Rich, before we open it up. Yeah. Uh, and that's really, I want to push you on, uh, to get your thoughts on China, right? So one could uh, cynically say that India may have hesitated, and when it finally was ready, its timing was terrible. Right, that, we've, that India finds itself now 
with a powerful China that very much uh, sees itself as having cast off any hesitations of a prior era. It conceives of itself as a great power. It is, uh, has an economy that is where India aspires to get to already, even if some of us do think that its political system uh, will have some bumps uh, that India may have already paid by the transition to democracy 70 years ago. But that the choice facing India, in a sense, is once again to choose essentially between two great powers, uh, in, in this case the United States and China, as opposing, as opposed to being a great power unto itself, right? really providing a third pole. Could you give us a sense in Delhi how people are thinking about China, what your own perspective on India, uh, India's path to great power status, and the role China would play in India? Yeah, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's one of the key questions. And one of the remarkable things I discovered is that the language that is used about China in New Delhi is strikingly similar to the language used in Washington um, about China. So you'll hear, look, there are elements of competition and cooperation. We're interested in, in not containing China, but uh, managing its peaceful rise and, you know, a China that plays by the rules. All that same language uh, is used between New Delhi and Beijing. The, the positive aspect about the India-China relationship, I, I would say, again, much like the U.S.-China relationship, is that there, when there is a concern, people pick up the phone and call and say, we are upset about your recent border incursion into you know, Arunachal Pradesh, or we are upset that you know, your, one of your submarines appeared off the coast. And so that doesn't happen on the western side, right? The, the India-Pakistan conversations are so sporadic and really just focus on counterterrorism that it's so limited, whereas the India-China conversations are broad there's economics, there's human rights, there's border security, there's uh, military interactions. Uh, so it's, it's very diversified. Now that doesn't mean that India is not looking down the road 15 to, to 20 years and, and thinking about what happens if China has this ability to have this incredible sphere of influence from East Africa to the East China Sea. India is seeing the same challenges that we're seeing. What does that mean uh, for China? And more directly, what is what does the China-Pakistan uh, relationship mean and the investments that are, that are coming across? So I, I think it's a, it, it is both a concern, it is also a huge economic relationship, and one, again, I think the, the reality is one that India cannot manage strictly by itself, and that's why the U.S., Japanese, Australia, uh, Russia, you know, talk about hedging and diversifying. I think India is really out there trying to make sure that it's in the strongest possible position if one day uh, there was this more immediate risk or threat from China. Let's have questions. Uh, and uh, let's start with Maina, uh, Dr. Singh. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, Ambassador Varma. Um, I'm from AU, I teach courses on India and South Asia, and I hope we will get you back someday to where you did your JD. Yeah. Um, uh, I liked the fact that you uh, opened by questioning the category of the middle power, because I think that does need to be unpacked. Um, but on another note, we might have a room full of people here who are aspiring to careers in policy or diplomacy, and now that you're no longer sworn by the oath of confidentiality, would you like to share? <laughs> well, would you like to share two incidents, maybe, where managing the expectations of the U.S. and resistance you encountered from the Indian positions made it a little difficult to balance the issues that you were working with? I know this was a great period in India-U.S. relations, and I have run into you at several of those occasions, but. It would be lovely to hear if there were a couple of those things that needed to be managed. Maybe the low points? You yes. Know, what, what, yeah. And how you dealt with them, a personalized, yeah. anecdotal, whatever you'd like to share. Yeah, look, um, I would say one of the low points, whenever you're an ambassador and you get summoned to the foreign ministry, right, that, that's never a good thing. And, um, 
And it wasn't a particularly positive moment at that time. And that was the week that we had announced our decision to go forward on a sale of additional uh, fighter jets to Pakistan. And so not only do you get summoned, but the foreign ministry makes the, the press aware that you're coming in. So there's there's no ability to you know sneak in the back door. You gotta you gotta walk through the gauntlet of press and and uh, you know look that uh, and that plays right at the heart of you know why we're not treaty allies, why we're 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 not you know across all of our, our challenges because we still have interests in a stable Pakistan that can fend off terrorists that doesn't align with India's view. And frankly, we have a, you know, it's a very, very complicated relationship with Pakistan. That is, uh, again, the single biggest challenging issue to deal with uh, for me in New Delhi was just trying to, and that's why we have a National Security Council to kind of pull all these competing interests together. I will say, you know, even though that was a difficult situation, what I remind people is we were talking about eight F-16s to go to, to Pakistan, right? I understand why the Indian government was upset about it. Uh, at the same time, we were talking about building 200 frontline fighters in India. So I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to uh, demean or relate our security relationship with Pakistan. I'm just trying to say it's on a very, very different scale. And so I, we, we periodically had to remind people um, of that. Um, you know, I, I'd be honest, we had very few kind of low moments like that in the, in the two plus years I was there. The other, I guess the other low moment for me uh, was when we had hundreds of Indian students turned around at the airports here in the United States and sent back. Now this isn't something that would appear on the front page of the Post or the New York Times. But every one of those stories was a personal story for the, that family that had saved money to send their kids. It was, uh, it was a humiliating experience. It was a scary experience. And I, I think it had the potential to create real damage on our relationship. And just to give you the, the full context, it was because DHS decided to take a different position, different from the State Department position on who was an eligible uh, student, and so we ended up with two sets of standards for students, and that was a real kind of not a great moment for U.S. governance, right? Uh, when when you can go get a valid visa, go through the interview, and yet when you get to the port of entry, face a different set of standards. And we tried to clean clean that up uh, pretty quickly, but only after six, seven, eight hundred kids had been turned around. Those two stand out as. Um, some of the more difficult uh, moments. I should uh, say that while Dr. Singh introduced herself as a professor at AU, which of course she is, she's also a very uh, published author on the Jewish diaspora uh, and uh, Indian diaspora in Israel and about the, uh, the Jewish populations in India. And also uh, her husband, Arun Singh, served as ambassador to the United States. And in, in that capacity, she was a marvelous representative of her country. And so thank you very much yeah. for your service thank tonight. You. Uh, Sanjeev? <laughs> Thanks, Irfan. Uh, Sanjeev Joshi Burang from Indiaspora. We are a nonprofit organization that uh, aspires to be a Davos for the global Indian. Uh, my question is on intelligence matters, and uh, it pertains specifically to India, although it may pertain to Korea as well. I don't know that for a fact. Uh, and it derives a little bit from what uh, Ambassador Verma was saying a short while ago about uh, Modi's remark about overcoming the hesitations of history. Uh, I was listening yesterday to Peter Lavoie speak at another event. And for those of you that may not be aware, Peter Lavoie was the special assistant to the president and senior director at the National Security Council at the, at, in the previous administration. And his remit was South Asia. Uh, and he was talking about the fact that the White House repeatedly approached India with offers to share intelligence to have a closer cooperation on matters of intelligence. And yet, repeatedly, India refused. Uh, and I guess my question is, 
I do understand, of course, uh, Rich, what you said about you know the complications of the India-Pakistan relationship and the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. But why do you think that is the case? Why is India not more closely allied with the U.S. on intelligence matters specifically? Uh, you know, what, your perspective, or I don't know if mine has a perspective as well. Yeah. You know, I uh, I'm, I didn't hear Peter's remarks, but I I didn't see that aspect of the relationship. In other words, I didn't see a big chasm between our, you know, and I, I look at intelligence cooperation as I do in the broader security cooperation. And I thought we were, we were coming together in all our aspects of homeland defense, uh, counterterrorism cooperation, intelligence sharing. And, and just give you one practical example, we signed an agreement that had been pending for years, probably six or seven years, the technical name, Raj will help me if I get this wrong, HSPD6, which is a database of all of the bad guys that we keep track of and gals. And um, we finally made that database available uh, to the Indians. They, and there was reciprocal um, you know, responsibilities on their side. So I, I actually, you know, frankly, just saw a different side of it. And, um, was quite encouraged by it. And I actually think it's only going to get stronger in the years ahead. Could you answer it any differently? Raj was uh, yeah. uh, I just want to make sure. In the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Abhishek, uh, and I'm a Georgetown Law alum. I, I practice as a human rights lawyer in India. And uh, my question was to Ambassador Verma. Uh, thank you for that You know, really insightful talk. Uh, can you just tell us, and this is not a foreign policy question, but just with regard to the strength of the rule of law and human rights institutions in yeah. India, over the last two years, what were some of the, the positives and what are some of the concerning signs that you saw? Yeah, Yeah, that was another interesting moment when, uh, I, I had a few in interesting moments. So I, you know, I had the other ambassadors, now I can talk about this, right? I had the, Many of the other ambassadors come to me and say, geez, I, I can't believe you actually spoke out about what's happening in civil society, or I can't believe you spoke out about free speech on, on college uh, campuses. You know, and both, I will tell you, were met with a big wave of the kind of Twitter sphere, you know, um, people saying, you know, everything from get out, what's your, what right do you have to comment on these issues? Um, but look, I would just say a, a country on the move, as I described it, a rising power, has these stresses and strains um, as it decides and wrestles with these questions. How much free speech on campus? Do you need to stand in a movie theater when the Indian National Anthem is played? Can a civil society organization take foreign funding, and if so, do you limit their um, types of activities? All those are, are live, real issues, right, playing out in front of people. Now, the reason I'm not a huge pessimist and saying the sky is falling in India is because these are the kinds of questions that big democratic systems wrestle with every day. We have not resolved these questions. Now, we have some baselines, right? We, we can't yell fire in a, in a crowded movie theater, but we still have free speech. We, we've kind of come down against hate speech in, in public places, right? We've drawn some lines. It took us a long time to draw those lines about what's, what's appropriate. India is in the process of drawing those lines. How much space do you want civil society to have? How much how much anti, you know, what people call anti-national uh, behavior can people handle in a democracy where you can have 500,000 people on the street in an hour? You know, so maybe their balance of law and order is different than the balance we would have. What can you post on the internet in India is very different than what you can post on the internet in the United States. I, I think I'm not trying to, um, kind of minimize the struggle that people are facing. And I met with a lot of different rights groups and human rights lawyers, and I totally, I, you know, I, I support the effort that they're, the fight that they're fighting. But I also don't think these fights are unusual. I think as long as people have the space, as long as there's a, a robust judicial system, a, a tradition of the rule of law, 
then you know I'm I'm generally again optimistic that the people will find the right balance and and people like you and other people will have to play a role in shaping it. I certainly can't do it from the outside. An American audience certainly will have no credibility uh, to do it. Th these are questions that have to be resolved within the four corners uh, of India. All right, let's just take two questions. Uh, Yash, please. Uh, just go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Do you know, follow of your uh, time in India and we walk the talk show to like. But the question that I wanted to ask was that you had this very sort of symbolic image that you were the first American ambassador to visit Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, I, I mean, like, that photo was laden with a lot of sort of political undertones given China's uh, claims to part, given the war that was fought. So, can you? I mean, was there a lot of consternation behind the <laughs> Like, does that have, can you speak a little bit about that section of American policy? Let me take a couple of questions that are final round. Siddharth uh, Chandra, I'm a professor at Michigan State University. And the question I had was about, you know, we talk about a rivalry between the United States and China today. I think all the speakers at, uh, in the front have mentioned it. Um, and, and the last time we had a great power rivalry of this magnitude was the Cold War was the United States and the Soviet Union. And there, the relationship was, you know, if you take politics or geopolitics or security on one side and economics on the other side, the economics was a very weak element of that relationship. And so decisions were made very heavily on the basis of geopolitical considerations right. and ideological up to, up to a point. I think to a large degree, the ideolo ideological angle has disappeared. I mean, this, this rivalry is not about ideology, though sometimes we try to make it out to be uh, that way. It's mostly geopolitics, security, and economics, right? And so since this is about middle powers, right, the role of middle powers in the Cold War um, was, you know, whatever role it was, the role of middle powers today is likely to be very different because we have a very different set of equations in, in play. How do you see the difference in Korea and India in this rivalry um, versus what it was during the Cold War? And last question, I'll give you over to Oh no, I was just adjusting the thing. <laughs> um, in the past few years, we've seen India develop a strong relationships with both the US and other countries close to the US, Japan, Australia, and so on and so forth. And Korea has done the same, being in the same general group of countries, but we've not seen India and Korea make a lot of progress on, the, on that particular front. Why do you think that is, and what, what do you think needs to change on both sides to, to change that? Let me start with you. You can take either of the, the last question or next question, and then have the last to close this up. So you mean why why not more deeper um, relations between, yeah, between, between India and Korea, uh, strategically speaking? In, or, every, in, in any sense. In any sense, um, I would think we're we're trying our hardest um, in in the economic sense to cooperate as as much as we can. Um, in in the strategic sense, um, I, I'm going from backwards. I'll, I'll get to uh, Professor Chandra's uh, question afterwards. Um, uh, strategic sense is. Um, is that Korea is, is although it's, uh, it's an aspiring middle power that, that, that wants to tackle global issues, it's a country that is uh, sort of handicapped, sort of trapped in. Okay? It's its own strategic uh, military conflict uh, with North Korea, uh, as well as being geopolitically caught between the great powers of uh, traditional war. During the Cold War, it was the Soviet Union the United States now, it's the United States and China. And then the historical baggage we have with Japan. So all of these problems, obstacles, sort of prohibit uh, Korea from really taking initiatives geopolitically outside the region. Okay, although we, we may have become a global player in the economic sense, um, geostrategically, particularly um, in strategic relations, we've not been able to overcome. And I think that's that's the primary reason uh, why why there isn't deeper relations between uh, India and, and, and Korea. 
And one of the things that, um, well, I personally pointed out was that strategically that uh, we need to, like Japan, we need to reach out to India in order to hedge against potential a rivalry between the United States and, and China becoming too intense. And, and that's exactly what Japan has been doing okay, with military exercises with India and all that. Um, now that's something that we need to get to, but like I said, with these obstacles, that it's something that we've not able to uh, get, get at uh, until this time. Um, uh, Professor Chandler's question. Um, I, I think, like, like you said, because of the economic aspect uh, that is prominent in, in global politics today, as opposed to what was during the Cold War, um, we find South Korea finds itself in a much more difficult situation, of course. Um, during the uh, conflict, U.S. conflict with the Soviet Union, yes, it, it was a geostrategic um, you know, logic to, 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 in order to preserve you know, our democratic way of life, we had to align with the United States. Okay? Of course, we had North Korea to deal with. Okay, so that that's sort of gave us, we didn't have options back then. Okay, it was just the United States. The United States came into the Korean War, uh, defended South Korea uh, from becoming entirely communist. Um, so after that, you know, it wasn't our choice. <coughs> right now, it seems like we do have a choice because we trade with China almost twice as much as we trade with the United States. Um, so our, our reliance on economic dependence on China is huge. And this is, this is becoming a, a huge domestic political factor as well. Um, there, there is uh, a, a clear distinction, what we call South-South debate within South Korea. Um, uh, one, on the one hand, they're saying that, that, that we need to lean more towards China as opposed to the United States. On the other hand, of course, these are more conservative uh, people who said that we need to strengthen our alliance with the United States because of this uh, threat of dependence on China. Um, so um, certainly it's, it's made it much more complicated, uh, but I do want to say that um, still, because of North Korea, okay, because of the threat that it provides South Korea, um, even when we're faced with that uh, choice, the options, the two options between which way to, to really swing, um, th there is no real incentive to, to swing towards China. Okay? Because that would be almost suicidal uh, you know, in terms of our threat that we face from North Korea, the competition that we've been going through with North Korea for the last 70 years. Uh, so, um, even, like I said, there is a South-South debate within Korea. Even the people on the left agree. President No Moon-hyun, that's a couple of presidents ago, he came on, on, a, on a, he came, he became president on an anti-American platform. Yet when he did become president, he, he pushed through the FTA with the United States. Uh, he, he tried to strengthen, uh, particularly intelligence-wise, uh, our relationship with the United States. So um, I'm fairly confident that most Koreans feel that that United States alliance, our alliance with the United States, still remains the pillar of our survival and our well-being. Um, so yes, there is a difference because of the economic aspect, uh, how we trade with China. But, but um, in terms of uh, where do we go from here, uh, I, I think the answer is fairly certain. Just say very uh, quickly, just building on that point, I, I, I also maybe see it very differently than the, you know, the U.S.-Soviet struggle, where it was really, you know, you could put in one column our countries, put another column their countries, few countries in, in the middle, and it's, it's definitely so much more complicated like that today. And our, our working relationship with China is so different. You know, if you were to ask the president about how we got the Paris Climate Agreement, he would say it was our work with China and India. You know, and, and, and solving kind of big global challenges, the Iran nuclear deal, China was actually a, a constructive member in, in enforcing the sanctions for a period of time. So we've been able to do global things with China. The 
economic pieces were so intertwined. You know, everyone's iPhone you know, very likely came from uh, China. You know, we, we wouldn't stop or couldn't stop our economic relationship today. But I think the professor painted it very perfectly about there is this battle for influence that we're having with the Chinese, with the other states, on the Korean Peninsula, in Southeast Asia, now obviously in, in South Asia. And it is, you see that firsthand. That, you know, let's hope that remains a, um, a peaceful, kind of cooperative kind of competition. But, so I, I think they're, they're very different. Just finally on the trip to Arunachal Pradesh, for those of you who don't know, Arunachal Pradesh is a state in northeastern India. Um, it, it's really up there in the upper right-hand corner uh, with uh, its northern border being China. And China contests part of Arunachal as belonging to China. We don't take that view. Uh, we haven't taken that view since uh, 1962 or 1961. We view Arunachal to be part of India. Uh, the part that I went to, Tawang, which was, I went for the Tawang Festival, but I was, you know, Again, fairly significantly, the first U.S. ambassador to go up there. He was only there for six hours. Um, the, the picture that you talk about, it's funny, everyone thinks there's a grand plan for some of these things. We were literally waiting for the helicopter to get fired up. And you know, the two chief ministers that were there, the chief minister of Assam and the chief minister of Arnachal, said, let's take a picture. I said, great. And, um, and that tweet that went out with that picture was the one that ended up on the papers across uh, mainly East Asia because it was viewed as we were somehow sending a uh, very clear signal. We really, we really were not trying to send a huge signal other than to greet the people up there um, and reaffirm what an important state and important part of India our natural actually is. This has been a real <laughs> pleasure. Um, before That's I... That's a big state. That's a big state uh, for an important part of India. Well, it's, that's U.S. policy. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, before uh, we ask you to join me in thanking our panelists, let me take the opportunity since I have you as a captive audience uh, to plug a couple of things we have coming up uh, here at the India Initiative. Next Wednesday in the afternoon, Milan Vaishnav will be doing a book launch of his new book, When Crime Pays, uh, Money and Muscle in Indian Politics. Uh, he'll take a slightly less optimistic view of Indian politics than Ambassador Burma uh, did, and that, so you can come here that perspective as well. Uh, in later in April, uh, Ram Guha, a uh, prominent Indian historian and public intellectual, will be speaking uh, about the Indian Congress Party and whether uh, its death would be beneficial for Indian politics. Uh, that will be on April 10th. And on April 22nd, uh, we will be uh, hosting our first uh, India Ideas Conference uh, that we look forward to hoping many of you into. We seek all your ideas and uh, finally there'll be plenty of uh, opportunities. Uh, we hope to continue interacting with the ambassador. As we mentioned at the outset, uh, he has very generously agreed to serve as a centennial fellow for the SFS uh, through July and after, and then the next academic year will be a senior fellow in the SFS uh, for the entire academic year. And, and Maina and I will have to arm wrestle as to whether he teaches at the SFS <laughs> or at AU, though with his capacity, I'm sure we could fill a classroom with, with students from both campuses uh, in, in the location TBD. Uh, anyhow, uh, in absentia, uh, Victor Cha, uh, Professor Jang Ho Kim, and Ambassador Barbara. Please join me in thanking you.